Hi, my name is Martin Mulder. I'm an Emeritus Professor of Educational Sciences of Wageningen University. Wageningen University, you may not know, it's uh, in the Netherlands. It's a small university, but the best in the world in its specific field, the field of agricultural sciences and environmental sciences. There we also had a Department of Education, which I, uh, I was heading, and I have had various functions over there, uh, including PhD consultations, advisory committees. I was heading the committee of promotions and tenure. Uh, now, you name it, you can imagine what the professor is doing at the university. I've been also very active uh, in the rest of the Netherlands, in Europe and in the world. Got uh, very much awarded by uh, my work, so I'm very happy that I'm now retired and have time for you to watch this uh, video. And um, that's um, interesting to mention the theme of today, which is competence. I have presented this theme many, many, many times. And one of the comments I often get is um, the, uh, that it is not only a scientific topic, but that uh, yeah, the topic can also be applied to the students themselves. In the personal life of students, but also in the future professional life. And I don't only get this comment of students, but also from senior professionals. So, um, yeah, indeed, competence can be used by various professionals and for ourselves it was uh, a discovery that even with farmers, and I'm talking about uh, small scale and medium scale uh, farmers in the field of greenhouse horticulture, in a project we did at the university, discovered that they have, have competence profiles themselves, that they even exist, and that um, yeah, they can be developed. They are very they discovered that they are related to their performance and that, uh, that their employees also have these competence profiles and that they can also be managed and developed, which is an interesting case because at the first time we did not expect that these people uh, would, would think these competencies would exist, etc. So that brings me to the title of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, class, uh, which is Competence-Based Vocational and Professional Education, Bridging the Worlds of Work and Education. Because you have made experienced in your studies a gap between the university and the world of work. Well, the whole notion of competence-based education is that students, you learn not only the scientific um, discipline and uh, the scientific knowledge, but you also have that you also learn to apply the knowledge in practice. So I would like to show you um, the parts of this intervention, this class. I will start uh, with learning theories very shortly. I will talk about the popularity of the competence concept. The competence movement as a worldwide movement. It's not only confined to my country, the Netherlands, or Italy, or Europe in, in, in total. It's, it's happening in all over the world. I always sh also uh, show some negative connotations of the competence concept. It's not only a positive story. Some people do not believe in it at all, or use it in a different way, in a negative way. I'll come back to that. I'll say something about the genesis of the competence construct and the research we have been doing at my university department when I was heading the department. I'll give an overview and a synthesis of that, uh, of that field and then I will go into the competence for life. Competence for life is important because uh, it's not only for the university or for education that we study, but it is for life that we study. Then I go into competence 3.0, competence for the unknown future. And that's a key issue in my, in my talk. And then I'll come to the conclusions. So, um, first of all then, there are many learning theories. Maybe you have had already some learning theories in your programs, 
or courses? Well, these are a range of theories that relate to vocational and professional education. You see, activity theory, agency, agency theory, but also experiential learning theory, flexibility, qualification theory. You see many kinds of theories with many scholars behind that that exist. And competence theory is only one of these theories. But as you will see, my next point is that even within competence theory, there is a very wide understanding of what competence is, and there are even many, even also competing theories. And I'll explain a little bit about that. So, um, competence-based education is more popular than ever. There are even YouTube films about that concept of well-known universities and well-known people. Uh, for instance, from a couple of universities uh, in the United States, but even, as you see, from President, past President Obama, who was talking about competence-based education and the university he was talking. And uh, there's films about the explanation about this theory and, and this approach, etc. You can, you can just go into the YouTube, uh, find competence or competency, education, based education, you will find that. Um, and I said, the competence movement is a worldwide movement. So, in, for instance, in China, you will see uh, projects on the implementation of competence-based education with highly skilled workers. I have an example of uh, the German Chambers of Commerce in a project in India. I have um, another example of Bangladesh in which competency-based training is uh, implemented. An example from Ethiopia, a project that I did myself in, in a complex, a big project on curriculum development for horticulture. Um, I have an example here of Nigeria, also competence-based technical education. Rwanda, uh, also a competence-based curriculum. One in Mexico, also competency-based education. And there is a Euro European competence framework for ICT, um, the European e-competence framework. And not long ago, well, it's now already uh, more than 10 years ago, but still very popular, uh, David Bartram developed the Great 8 Competency Framework, trying to combine the most important competencies for performance in practice. And you see here these, these eight competency uh, uh, domains, leading and deciding, supporting and cooperating, interacting and presenting, and all the others. It's an attempt of him to, to get all the competencies of people in professional work in one framework, which would explain all performance. There is another attempt, which is not so much related to the generic field of competencies of people. That is uh, more the professional competence approach. An example of this is given by the uh, medical field from Canada, the Canadian Medical uh, uh, Association. It uh, developed a competency framework in uh, 2015, and even also uh, there's a book on competence in medicine from Cornell Press in 2012. And these models are much more oriented towards the content of professional work. So if you go into the competence framework of CanMeds, you will see what a doctor, medical specialist has to do. He has to take care of the client-patient relationship. He or she has to take care of the medical anamnesis, what's the problem, the medication, the checkup, etc. <clears throat> So these are examples from the medical, uh, the medical sector, which are very, very uh, dominant at the moment. There's even a new journal on competency-based education worldwide, based in America. It's a worldwide journal. And there are growing uh, 
results and there's growing evidence for the effects of competence-based training also in practice. This is an example of a study and the application of competency-based education in laparoscopic training. So, we have seen lots of examples and the fact that competence actually is a worldwide, worldwide movement. But now, I will review uh, a, a certain group of studies that we did in uh, our own chair group on purchasing. We have developed purchasing, competence, frameworks. We have uh, developed extension, competence frameworks. Uh, another one is entrepreneurship, competence frameworks. And you see many other examples here like open in innovation competence, of open innovation projects, argumentation competence, multicultural cooperation competence, teachers competence, practical training, competence of teachers in practical, practical training situations. And all these have been studied in terms of uh, PhD projects. So you see here a couple of them. You see here, what is it, 15, 16, and 15 or so, 18 or so. 18 of these uh, dissertations of, uh, there were more than 20 in my group, still five going on, as I said. And uh, you, can, you can browse that if you find it interesting. If you, for, for instance, want to do a project on open innovation or learning, you can, you can download that from the internet. They're all on the Wageningen University and Research website. Um, it's not only that um, competence is an idea, or it is a philosophy, or is it a set of frameworks? It's also in practice, and more than that, it is even now institutionalized. Many people often ask uh, about competence and say, um, yeah, is it new? Well, actually, it's not new. I'll talk about that. But the institutional use of it is actually new, because you see, many of these uh, frameworks in the European documents of the European Union, the Commission, the Parliament, etc., etc. And there's all kinds of regulations and declarations. And the most important thing in, in education now is, I would say, the European Qualification Framework in which competence is a pillar. And even in the recent uh, Riga conclusions of vocational education and professional education, competence is seen as a policy option. As I said, competence is not only used in a positive way, it's sometimes also used in a negative way. I have taken some examples from movies. When I look at the movie, I very, very often see the, the phrase, this is a matter of incompetence. You are incompetent. He is in fire, uh, fired because of his incompetence. Well, that's interesting. Look at this, uh, this live uh, film of uh, Janis Joplin. I don't know whether you know uh, the uh, artist anymore, but it was a very famous singer in the 60s, a very famous rock singer. Um, and she had a band, um, Big Brother and the Holy Company was the name of the band. And there appeared uh, a review of the, the performance of the band with Janis Joplin as the lead singer. And this critic uh, wrote down on paper in the review that it is a shame for Janis Joplin to perform with this band because she is very, very good. She's maybe the best singer next to Aretha Franklin, and that's a big thing. But the band is slightly better, slightly better than competent. I've got another example from Philadelphia, you know. The movie of the, the, the gay movement in Philadelphia, in the United States, plays in the 1990s. The film was of 1993. And it turns out that uh, the, the main player is gay, the main artist. 
the main, um, well, the main, the main person, the actor. And there's a, there's a legal case of Beckett against Wheeler. Wheeler is the employer and Beckett is the employee. And, uh, well, the employer is saying, well, uh, they fired the person because of his incompetence. But actually, at the back of everybody's mind at that time, was that the employee was fired because he introduced his aids at the workplace, which at that time was a very, very sensitive issue. So Wheeler said, wait a minute, the man was fired for incompetence, right? Another example is James Bond, in his latest movie, Skyfall. Maybe some of you are fans of James Bond, not everybody maybe, but um, Bond got a new quartermaster. You remember the quartermaster in his white jacket with all the gadgets, the guns and the, 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 the cars, etc. And the, and the uh, bombs in, 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 in pens, etc. All these gadgets. But you know that that, that person left the movies, uh, unfortunately. And he has a new quartermaster, as this person is called. But he is a very young guy. Look at the picture. And then uh, he's introducing himself. He says, Hi, 007, I'm your new quartermaster. And then James Bond says, You must be joking. And then yes, he said, why? Because I'm not wearing a lab coat? And Bond says, because you have still have spots. And then the guy says, but my complexion is hardly relevant. And Bond says, well, your competence is, because he believes that this guy has no experience at all, he cannot work in the field. And then the guy said, well, you know, age is not a guarantee of efficiency. And Bond goes, and youth is no guarantee of innovation. And Q was saying, I'll hazard that I can do more damage on my laptop, sitting on my pyjamas, before my first cup of Earl Grey, than you can do in a year in the field. And it turns out, of course, actually at the end, at the end of the movie, that Q is uh, rescuing Bond because of his IT skills. It's a modern way of doing uh, this kind of work in espionage. James is, James is in. I'm going now into uh, a bit of history, history of the competence concept. Where does it come from? Where does the concept come from? Well, it comes originally already from, I would say, history of mankind. And the oldest uh, reference I found was in the Code of Hammurabi in the 17th century before the Christian era. It's a long time ago. You know, Hammurabi was known, among other things, for his harsh laws, which were carved in stone. They could not change, because they were carved in stone. And one of these stones is in the uh, Louvre in Paris, and I was there once, and I made a picture of this stone from granite, granite, a hard stone. And these are the laws of Hammurabi. And there it says, Hammurabi, the law, uh, incompetence, incompetence, I would say in French, the, the, the roi compétent, the competent king, as it is translated. And that is already then the use of this concept, which is very old. And I'm saying, yeah, I think it's as old as mankind. As I said, you see again, it's a new thing. Is it institutional approach? So I repeat this to show it deliberately once more because competence is now integrated in all kinds of uh, documents, in frameworks of, of companies, in frameworks of education. There's old roots of the word uh, in Sanskrit, in Chinese, in Greek, in Latin, in all kinds of Western European countries from the Middle Ages. And you see them here. I have to go back into the Sanskrit and the Chinese to, to really look at the meanings. I've done Greek already. Ikanotis is most close. The quality of being capable. So I found that very interesting when I was studying that field. So it's not for me only a field of practice, but also a field of study. 
I saw uh, the early notions in educational reports in 20, 1929, in educational books. Maybe some of you know John Dewey is one of the main United States educational philosophers. His book from 1916 addressed a democratic ideal, and he said that everybody should develop competence already at that time to choose and pursue a career. I also said, or, uh, was looking at the literature of later that century, but not long ago I found the so-called, what I now know, you know uh, uh, referred to as the new first uh, publications on competence of uh, people from the 1950s, and people were even reviewing the literature from the first half of the 50s, and um, also 1954, a publication on the, and the identification of the effect of instructor, a review of the quantitative studies, 1900 to 1952. So there was already a lot of work in the first half of the, of the last century uh, on competence, competence development. A long time we thought that White was introducing the concept first in 1959 in psychology as an alternative for motivation psychology of Freud, who was believing in unconscious and conscious drives and whole on drive reduction. Maybe you have had psychology classes in which we, you learned about this, this kind of uh, theory. But uh, White was saying that uh, children and adults are being driven by the need for achievement. They want to learn to master things. So if you look at babies, they want to crawl, they want to walk, they want to speak, to communicate, and later on they want to learn to be, be able to communicate with friends, etc. So it's a lot of innate, you could say innate drive to be competent. That was his philosophy. So his, his, his view on competence was it is the ability to interact effectively with the environment. Chomsky was the one who uh, studied and propagated the whole notion of language, competence, and saw performance of the linguistic output, so the ability to speak, to create sentences that nobody has ever spoken, is the language competence. Peter and Hull were talking about, it was especially Peter, about increasing levels of competence. People are being promoted because of higher level of competence. They have success, get promotion, until the level that they are not competent anymore to even further learn, and that leads to failure. In the beginning this was more thought of being a joke, but his book, or their book, was, I think, translated in 38 languages or so, and was, was having an influence. So it's called the Peter Principle. You get promoted till your level of incompetence. Well, for some people that may, may hold, for other people that may not hold. Organizations have found ways to deal with that, obviously, and people themselves also, but at that time, very popular. McClelland, he was speaking about the um, way of testing of students, how that happened, and the way of testing intelligence. It was the late 60s, beginning 70s, that he uh, created his theory, and he said, well, you know, all this testing by intelligent tests, etc., and school tests, knowledge tests, actually is not working very well. It does not have much prognostic validity. We can better test for competence, see what people actually can do. It predicts job success to a very much higher degree. His speeches, his publications have been very, very influential and has resulted in a whole series of projects in the field of management theory, management development, management training. It was Tom Gilbert who introduced the idea of engineering worthy performance competence, 
in terms of engineering it, engineering worthy performance that has a value. Uh, and he was uh, studying that, uh, especially then in relation with performance of people in organizations, but also in society. It was a very influential book as well. And Richard Boyatzis is in the school of McClelland, etc. He was talking about the competent manager, and he has uh, written a big study, done a big study, the Hay McBurr Group, a big consultancy firm, which was followed up by other, many other people. It was a basis also for much uh, management selection and training and development. Richard Boyatzis. Habermas, the sociologist, even used the terms competence in terms of cognitive competence, linguistic competence, interactive competence. It was the, 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 the group Prahalat and Hemel in 1990 who brought the whole competence movement into the discussion of business and co corporate strategy. They were saying that if an organization is emphasizing on their core competence, they are doing better. And they showed many examples of that. And it, it resulted in the, into a movement in the 90s, actually, that big organizations were outsourcing their support functions, like purchasing or even sometimes human, human resource management, cleaning, um, retail, uh, etc. So they were focusing on the core competence of what the organization could do best. And core competence means that the organiza organization earns most by that, by that production process or that competence as, as, as it is called. It is difficult to, to copy and it is embedded in the people's minds and in, in, in the competence architecture of the organization. Prahalat and Hemel, very influential. Then Eraut, Michael Eraut, was talking about professional competence of people, teachers and nurses and those kinds of jobs. And he showed the ways in which people develop that. Very, very interested for, interesting for human resource management and development, of course. And Quinn, uh, with a whole group of co-authors, they introduced the same line of thinking in management development. And they um, were speaking about the competency framework based on competing values of people. As you all know, management has a, quite a lot of theories, even human resource management, many theories, and some of them are conflicting, right? So Quinn and others said, we have to combine those conflicting ideas and make sure that in teams, there's people with these conflicting ideas, with different roles, with different belief systems, because they, they are complementary. And it's not, not, not so important to have only the individual competence. It is also important to think about the team competence, the collective competence. Now, maybe you know the book, the book on becoming a master manager. It has a lot of uh, examples of ways in which uh, these competences of people can be developed. Well, there's the current state of competence practices. There's professional associations that have competence frameworks, <coughs> like the medical association I showed. Governmental organizations have the competencies, for instance, of teachers, other professionals. Testing companies have competence measurement tools. Consultancy firms, HR consultancy firms, have competence dictionaries. Advisory services for assessment and development. Organizations have their competence management systems. Educational institutions have implemented qualification frameworks in which competencies are integrated. Now, quickly and shortly, a review of some work we have done in the chair group for the Department of Education Competence Studies on which competencies to identify. You see that this slide, I so, I showed already earlier, it is a review of the fields in which we developed competency profiles, so that is a repetition. 
But not only for that, we don't, didn't only develop those competency profiles, we also elaborated learning arrangement and did studies into the learning arrangement as to how to best learn those competencies. So we designed a framework for competency-based education to, to, to measure where an education program is in terms of its level of agreement with competency-based principles, pitfalls of it. We did a program in Uganda, Ethiopia. We studied ways in which argumentation of students can be better developed by computer-supported collaborative learning platforms. We studied intercultural cooperation, learning environments in international study groups, very important I would say at the moment. We also studied oral presentation competence, uh, lately also with virtual reality, in which students yeah, have their virtual reality glasses on and practice oral presentation skills. Well, there's more than that, but I will leave it with that. Uh, you can, if you're interested, look at that further. And we have studied the effectiveness of various of these uh, learning arrangements in greenhouse horticulture, in open innovation, in large organizations, in authentic assessment, in competence-based education, again, argumentation competence, uh, competence-based education in Ethiopia, and a lot of other studies. So the research background we have to uh, address these issues is quite big. Competence frameworks can be developed in various ways. And in education, we have this framework on strategic alignment, which says that education programs have to have learning outcomes, they have to have learning arrangements, and they have to have outputs in terms of educational achievement. And you can align that based on your educational philosophy. And um, our view is that that should be based also on competence frameworks. It works the same in uh, uh, a regular organization, not only in, 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 in education, but also in companies. You would have uh, performance profiles, competence profiles, you will have that uh, translated into selection and uh, interviewing into development and into measurement of effects, etc., assessment. And these competencies frameworks, they come from different angles, from the economic side, uh, from the research side also. What does research say about a certain professional field? Also from society, but also from politics. All these four influences make, via a deliberate approach of course, the competence frameworks. So let's go to an overview and structure of that field of competence. There have been many reviews and critiques. I also already showed the, uh, the, the examples of the, the movies, but also in the literature there are many, many critiques, critical remarks about the competence movement in books that are listed over here by Grant and Elstrom and Lund, also in a recent uh, book from Lund, and all the other authors that you see here. Um, because of the scattered field, everybody saying something has a theory of this and that, and has a critique on this and that. Some four years ago, at this time of the year, uh, a bit earlier, I decided to, uh, to create a book on it, uh, a big book, in which the many vi views uh, could be collected, many authors in the field of competence-based education, professional education as well. In this book, Competence-Based Education and Professional Education, we have 50 chapters uh, of 85 authors together from all continents, and uh, we have set up questions up front and we'll end with answers on those questions at the end of the book and the book uh, addresses the whole field so that we have one source with the many views on this field. And it appeared this year, actually it appeared last year, the end of last year, 
And so it's already, I would say, three and a half years ago that I decided to, uh, to make this. And it took three and a half years to actually develop it. It was a big, big endeavor, together with Springer and the many people. And I'm happy that it is there now, and I'll get some ideas out of the book to present to you. The first thing of, of, of that's very important is the two meanings, actually, of competence in practice. It is, first of all, the uh, capability to perform, well, for human resource management uh, and human resource development professionals, management professionals in general, very important competence is the capability to perform, can do things. It has uh, connotations with ability. But it is also related, second meaning, to the right to perform. The legal, having the legal authority, the licensure or the certification to perform, like a medical specialist can only do certain surgeries if he or she is licensed to do it. A pilot can also only fly a certain plane if he or she is licensed, licensed for it. It also is about institutional and organizational, cultural or regulated powers and the approval to decide or to approve, to regulate. The parliament, the parliament has certain competencies. A court, a law court, has competencies, etc. There's three groups of competence three theories that was, yeah, I say, in the, in, the, in the process to develop the book. I was sitting down and thought about all these theories, and I published a bit early already these three theories of competence, functional behaviorism, mainly starting in the 50s and the 60s, was very popular in that time. The context was training, but the pitfall was over specification. So there were laundry lists, long lists of very, very specific competence that didn't work in practice. From that, there was the second movement on integrated occupationalism. That was taken up by education. So they made the competency frameworks, they tried, to, most of them, tried to, to adapt their education program to it, but it led to performatism, so over reliance on performance. But now, the last 10, 20 years, we see the theory of situated professionalism with a development orientation. But the problem there is, over generalization. The typical human resource manager is saying if we address three competencies this year and next year, that's already enough. Yeah, that can be true for, for, for human resource management, but it is not true for human resource development or for training nor for education. Because that needs more specification, right? I would say the three theories are still in practice, and maybe we need all the, all the three in the training context, in the education context, and the development context. We also have three types of competencies. I've called them competency one, two, and three. Competency one is competence for specific activities, very, very known and specific ones. Competence 2 for known jobs, competence 3 for the unknown future. I will speak about that a bit more. But as a uh, intermezzo, you see here a picture of, yeah, what is it? And my question is always, is what are these people thinking of? Well, look at that group and ask yourself the question, what are the people, these people thinking of? And probably you did not think of this. This is a flower field. Because that, that is what people are thinking about. Because the picture is made at the Dutch flower auction. It's a very famous uh, company. Here you see the auction. And you saw the professional sitting down there. And this is the trade room of the, uh, uh, with, with all the cards, etc. And my, my story is always this. The point is that these people, these professionals need knowledge on product quality, market, on skills on multitasking, information processing, 
and attitudes and stress tolerance, feeling for sales, openness for change, etc., etc. Competence is for me also a kind of dimension, very elementary competence and very high level competence. The very high level competence is brilliant. A person is brilliant. And I sometimes use the, the example of Ricardo Chailly and Maria Joao Pires to show what brilliance actually is, because Pires, as an extremely brilliant pianist, came in the Royal Concert Hall in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, to play a piece in front of the audience, live, right? And Ricardo Chailly and his orchestra, they started the concert. And what happened? It is an other concert than Pires, the piano player, was practicing before. She didn't even have the papers with her. So during the first measures of the music, Chailly was seeing the panic in the eyes of Pires. Imagine the situation. You there did not prepare it. You even have, don't have the music. So, as an extremely competent director or conductor, Chailly said, Maria, Maria, relax. You know, you played the piece last year and it was perfect. You can do it. Absolutely, you can do it. And Maria Perez was quieting and she grasped her nerves. And when she needed to play, she started to play and did the piece impeccable, flawlessly. It's impossible to think of, but it happened for real. That is brilliance as an extreme level of competence. I find it a perfect, a perfect example. So my, to, to summarize this, my understanding of competence is these are integrated capabilities consisting of clusters of knowledge, skills and attitudes, right? Attitudes. That was the part that was so important in the example of Maria Perez. It's the attitude, the right attitude to, to work with. Not say I can't do it. Just do it. Conditional. See, competence is conditional for sustainable, effective performance, including performance, uh, problem solving, realizing innovation, and creating transformation in a certain profession, occupation, in a job, or a role, or an organization, or a situation. Well, I'm coming to my last, last points. Competence for life. As I said, we don't need competence for education, we need competence for life. Not only for studies, but for success in life, in jobs and outside jobs. Well, you see many examples nowadays of that as well. I have here an example of competence for life in Nepal, for community development. Well, this one from Uganda again, community life competence. I have here various models of competence for future life. The De Soka model, the key competence model, the 21st century skills model, the essential learning outcomes model, seven survival skills for today's students, the P21 project, the 21st century skills framework, and critical competencies for the future leadership. There's so many of these, these examples which stress the importance of competence worldwide in various in various applications. There's the global competence movement from this center, the Center for Global Education, to make students, professionals, kids in this in this in this sense also aware of the global community. Very important. For subject matter areas like this uh, this one, the Global Competence Matrices for various subject areas. For assessments in education, business and, and government, profit and non-profit. The Global Competence Aptitude Assessment System. The OECD Program for International Assessment of Adult Competencies, the PIAC model for assessment of all kinds of, all kinds of competencies. But also training programs for global 
global competence. So to get the certificate, for instance, as a trainer or teacher for global competence. The Council for Europe recently, 2016, last year, published the competencies for democratic culture. Also very important to have this notion on the table. The global competency for an inclusive world of the OECD in 2016. All these different models, it's kind of the same thing as with the book I did. There's so many differences. So I tried to look at all these, these models and come up, come up with a suggestion, only a suggestion, to, to integrate that a bit and, and come up with the, a model for competence 3.0 for the unknown future. I already, already published a, a list once on these competencies like ambiguity handling. Argumentational reasoning, balancing interest, complex problem solving, computational thinking, creativity, entrepreneurship, and you name it. The more generic, future-oriented competencies people need. And I went on with this, and um, coming from Wageningen, I found it interesting to, to have a, a flower, a plant picture, with these four leaves, which brings luck. And uh, I said, this is maybe an interesting model for the Compass for Life. In the middle, right in the center, integrative learning competences. Most important is the learning competence of people. In education, outside education. In human resource management, outside of it. Learning by doing, by experiencing, by communicating, by being a member of a community practice, whatever, most important. And I had two dimensions, the self and career competence and disciplinary and interdisciplinary competence as a vertical dimension and the personal professional competence and the social professional competence as the horizontal dimension. And I, for all these leaves and for the center, proposed a series of competencies for instance, these for integrative learning competence, like ambiguity, uncertainty handling, to learn to cope with that, dealing with vulnerability and ambiguity, but also the developmental competence, evaluation competence. And you, you see on them. These are examples of competencies mentioned in all these documents, of these frameworks that I've shown. And of course, it goes on like that, the competencies for disciplinary, interdisciplinary competence in that field, the competencies for self-management and career competence, well, you being in, in education and maybe also in work and in human resources, you see what is important in terms of self-management and career competence, like acting autonomously to learn to do that sometimes against the rules of the organization, in the better of the organization, for the better of the future. I would say sustainability is an issue like this. Acting autonomously, of course, communicate about that and be, be, be open about that. Self-regulation competence, to be able to self-regulate your future, to make your own choices, to set your own goals, and to be true to them. Civic knowledge, life planning competence, well, it goes on and on like this. You have more time to study that. Um, then the personal professional competence, adaptability, flexibility, agility, and the like. I will not further elaborate this. This is more for, for further study. If you are interested in this field, social professional competence, clarification, collaboration, creating ecosystems for engagement, etc., etc. So with it, I come with to my conclusions. First of all, you have understood there is a wide variation in competence theories, right? So very many views. The competence approach is also much criticized. But it's widely applicable, it's widely used, it's more popular 
worldwide than ever. The concept has a long history. It's actually not something new, but it's institutionalized in many ways. And even in organizations, if you apply for jobs, if you have a job, you're being assessed on your competencies. Many competence-based education initiatives concentrate on known tasks and present jobs, which I have explained, but it's important that we also think about the competencies for the unknown future, to not only be able to cope with the unknown future, but also to create a new future and a better future. And I think research, more research is needed into dedicated learning arrangements to develop those future competencies. And also in HR, to develop de developmental approaches that also stress the future development of organizations and the society. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was of interest of you. And if you've got questions or want to contact me later on, you find my contact details here. Don't hesitate to drop a line. I'm retired as a professor, so I have more time than before. So you know, uh, I'll, I'll address your questions if you have them. Thank you very much.